Hello and welcome to this channel. Before we continue, I would like to invite you to subscribe to our channel. This will enable these messages to reach a wider audience. Thank you very much. When we were praying in the prayer meeting Wednesday, this verse came to me ever so strongly. She mentioned in 2 Corinthians and chapter 8. And I just wanted to share a few thoughts when I find my Bible about it. Now, it's a situation where the Apostle Paul is talking about gifts being sent to the churches in one particular church. And he says this thing in the middle of his epistle, 2 Corinthians, chapter 8. And I'm not going to comment on the gifts on the collection of, for the saints, so that's what it was. But he said something, which, I, which came to my heart, as I said, in the prayer meeting. Just this first nine, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Do we know the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it just something we've heard about, we read about? But do we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? That though he was rich, Yet for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich, and should be there, might become rich. That's what you might have in some versions, because that's how it should be translated. And through his poverty, you might be made or become rich. And I want to look, and you might, I don't, I think it's important if we're reading our Bibles, if we have the time to look a bit deeper. And I want to bring out, what does that mean, Paul? How was, how was Jesus, how did he become poor? Well, we know we read elsewhere that, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes through a list of though he, be, he was God, he thought it not robbery to be equal. God made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. So Jesus... And though he was God, he went down, if you like. To me, I have a picture. I, I think, you know, I think in pictures. I, I think most of us do. He came down from heaven, if you like, and was born in that, became a little baby. And he could have been destroyed by Herod, couldn't he? He would have been about, I don't know. They reckon four or five years old by the time, time Herod went out to try and destroy him. But they were in Egypt then. It fled into Egypt. So he was, Jesus was dependent on another human. God was dependent on an earthly mother who gave him birth. God came by the Spirit of God into a woman who was a nobody. Mary, Mary was a nobody. I've written it up here. Mary was a nobody. 
It was just a village girl in the village. She wasn't, you know, like any, she was in the little village. She was a no one. And her husband was just the carpenter. That's who God decided to dwell with and live with. And when he was 12, he was found when they went down to the feast and a whole, all of them probably coming up, going back to Nazareth. Lots of people, there'd have been lots of them, aunties and uncle, uncles and other families, they'd have all traveled together. And of course, they didn't really miss Jesus until they'd gone two days. I said, where is that little rascal? Where has he gone? <laughs> and they found him back in the temple in Jerusalem, talking with the, the elders, the Jewish elders. And he went back, and it says that he was subject unto them. He was subject to a man who wasn't even his father. Because, and he was also subject to his true father. And the only way he could be subject to his, to Joseph is because he was subject to his heavenly father. He had a disposition about him that was poor. And that's what that word means. He became poor. It's a Greek word, pochotio, 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 which means a pauper. Do you know what a pauper means? A pauper, pauper. So he was reduced to begging. That's what the word means. Not that Jesus begged, but it's equivalent to someone that is reduced to begging. So when we read he became poor for our sakes, and I've looked at the definition in Webster's Dictionary, and this is what it says. A level of poverty in which real hardship and deprivation are suffered and the comforts of life are wholly lacking. I'm going to read that again because it's the word here, I should have said, indigence. You heard of that word? Indigence. Some people are shaking their head. They've never heard of it. It's the English word indigence. It's also a French word. So those of you who are French will know, but this is what it means in English, a level of poverty. So it's not just someone coming knocking on the door and say, oh, I, I need money to go and visit my uncle over in Lyon, as we had a man come here once. He was living in one of these places where you could go. If you had no home, you could pay so much and they put you up. But Jesus never had that. It's a level of poverty in which real hardship and deprivation are suffered. So he would have suffered deprivation. And the comforts of life are wholly lacking. You know, Jesus said, and we're going to look at it in a minute, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He says the birds have nests. The foxes have holes. Well, I, son of man, has nowhere. What a place to be. He became that for us. He willingly became that. 
for me and for you. And the word there in our text, that we might be made rich or become rich through his poverty. We must never miss that little, those two words, three words, through his poverty, his poverty. Through his poverty, poverty, we have become rich. And that word rich, it means opulence, to abound, to abound, to have over and abundance what we need. Paul says that through the riches of his grace, we have riches. So will he not give us all things? He who gave his son to die, will he not with him give us all things? Of course, wicked men have taken this totally out of the place where it belongs and they say well if you give us your money you'll become rich like me and you can have airplanes and big houses and all that they corrupt the word of god They're, these men are inspired by devils and there's many of them around making themselves rich and making others poor because really they're stealing their money off them, these so-called tele-evangelists. But Jesus wants to make us rich in the heavenly way. We are blessed in the heavens. And I could look at so many verses and we can't go turning back and forth. I want to go into Matthew chapter 8. I want to look at something which I believe is the true meaning. Although this is pre-Calvary, this is pre-Pentecost, but this was Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 8, which I've already quoted to you, There's so much here. Verse 19 of Matthew 8. A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. I'll follow you wherever you go. Doesn't matter where you go, I'm going to follow you, he said. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head, nowhere to lay his head. And another of his disciples, so this man was already a disciple, he was already a follower, said, Lord, Suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, and he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. What a statement. Lord, 
save us, we perish. You know, Jesus became poor that we might become rich. They realize that, I don't know, it's talking about the sea, but it's far more relevant than that to you and me and to the whole world. They said, save us, we perish. It's concerning a certain circumstance. But it has far greater meaning than that. When we come to the place and we realize I'm perishing, we'll call out to Jesus. And he said unto them, why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose. Do you notice that Verse 24, it says, a great tempest arose. And now it says that Jesus arose. Much greater than the tempest. Here's one who's much greater than the tempest that arose. His name is Jesus. And rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him. Well, what manner of man, this is what manner of man he was. He had nowhere to lay his head. He had become, in the eyes of the world, a pauper. He, no one regarded him. And you know that when he went back to Nazareth, it said of Jesus that he couldn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And they said, is this not Joseph's son, whose brothers and sisters are with us? They, they only understood Jesus to be the son of Joseph. That's the only way that they could identify him. This man who was healing the sick and casting out devils, which we'll see a bit more of in a minute. Is this not Joseph's son? How can this be? This is only Joseph's son. He's a nobody. His mother was a had a son out of wedlock, so they thought. They thought Jesus was illegitimate. Of course, the Jews still teach that in their Talmud. Wicked thing, that is. He was nobody. He'd made himself to be nobody so that you and I could become rich. What manner of man is this? When we think of Jesus, do you think he is a great person, don't we? He, he was this, he was that, you know, he, miracles here, and as we read here, silence the sea. What manner of man? Well, this is the manner of man he is. He, he became poor for us. He became a nobody in the eyes of the world. He was nothing. He said, come unto me and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest. What had they found here? Said the sea. And the winds obeyed him, and there was a great calm. And so, in verse 28, And when he came to the other side of the country, of the Gadarenes, no, they pronounce it different here, Gadarenes, I know it as, but never mind, they met 
They met him two men possessed with devils. I'm going to take this up elsewhere, and I think we'll go in into Luke, and I think it's far more details, and I want the details because the details are important. Matthew didn't record this in so much detail. In fact, he says there were two men where Luke and Mark say there were one, one man. So in chapter 8 again, but this time Luke. Just because there seems to be a different observation of a situation does not mean the situation didn't occur. So it's like when you witness an accident, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, if you witness an accident and someone else witnesses an accident, you have a different take on it. Maybe you were in a different place. Maybe you were stood somewhere else. Maybe there was other people who distracted you, this, that, and the other. So although it's, Matthew says there was two men and Luke and Mark say there are only one, don't discredit the truth by your ignorance. So, verse 34, so fair way down. I got verse 34, but we need to start before that, don't we? So let's start in verse 27. And they went forth to land. They met him out of a certain city, a man, which had devils long time and wear no clothes. This man was naked. Neither he abode in any house, but in the tombs with the dead. This man was dead. As far as the rest of the world were concerned. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God, Most High? I beseech thee, torment me not. In another version, it said, You're going to torment me before our time. What does he mean? Well, he's talking about hell. And we find it in another place, the abyss. Don't put us in the abyss. Abyss. The abyss. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he break the bands and was driven of the devils into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils had entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to be cast into the deep, the abyss, that's the word, the deep, the abyss. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. I just, I don't think Luke records this, but there were about 2,000 pigs. 2,000 pigs. In fact, I made a note of it in Mark. In Mark's gospel, it says there was about 2,000 pigs. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. And when the devils out of and went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, 
and the herd ran violently down a steep place into a lake and were choked. Then they that fed them saw what was done. They fled and went and told it in the city and in the country or in the fields, literally. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he was, was possessed of the devils, was healed. And so it goes on. And this man was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Did you read that? He was in his right mind, clothes, so he now had clothes on. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Who else? There's several people in the, in the Gospels who were at the feet of Jesus. That's the place we've got to come to. It's the place he will come to if we know Jesus. See, this man didn't know Jesus, but Jesus knew he was there in the tombs. His father had told him to go. There's several places, and I won't pick them all out, but see, Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Nowhere. He had no home. He had nowhere. He said, well, he lived with, with Mary and Joseph, yes, but then he, when he, he left there, he, he was following the voice of his father. He didn't own anything. He didn't even own a bicycle. He didn't even own, a, not that there were any bicycles, he didn't even own a donkey. It's the day that he went into Jerusalem, he said to his disciples, go and you'll find a donkey. Say to him that owns it, the Lord hath need of this. It was a borrowed donkey. And we need to understand that he became poor. It's only out of his poverty that you and I can be made rich, that we can benefit. We benefit from the fact that he was poor. We benefit from the fact that Jesus, God became a man, and emptied himself. That's what we read. Being found, then he was found in fashion as a man. I wonder how we really understand the nature of Jesus. Really, what we really think he's like. Mm -hmm. And of course, he paid the ultimate price. He took our sins upon him. You know, but he couldn't have taken our sins upon him if he hadn't first emptied himself and become obedient unto death and become as the this word here, indigent. See, if he, he I think it's Charles Wesley, he writes a hymn. Let me just find it a minute. I'm going to read this, these words to you from the pen of, of Charles Wesley. Great, a great poet. 
as it comes to mind. How do thy mercies close me round? Forever be thy name adored. I blush in all things to abound. The servant is above his Lord. Now, Jesus said the servant is not above his Lord, but Charles Wesley had discovered that he couldn't really become as low as Jesus. And he went on to write, Inured to poverty, there's the word, and pain, a suffering life my master led, the Son of God, the Son of Man, had not where to lay his head, but lo, a place he has prepared for me, whom watchful angels keep. Nay, he himself becomes my guard. He smooths my bed and gives me sleep. But right there at the beginning, inured to poverty and pain, a suffering life, my master led, the Son of God, the Son of Man, had not where to lay his head. And I think that we can sometimes get the wrong understanding, impression through lots of, through the culture, the Christian culture, if you know what I mean by that. But Jesus was in the eyes of the world a pauper. He became a pauper, and that's what it means. He became a pauper, that out of his poverty we might become rich. It's only a short message really today. But just think about this, that that man who was possessed with all those devils, because of who Jesus was. It's not because he was a great miracle worker. We've got to get that idea out of our heads. He wasn't a magician. He was someone, it was out of his poverty. It was out of the disposition of who Jesus was in himself, that he was able to minister to other people. Ministry flows from a place of knowing who Jesus is and knowing who we are in him. And people make terrible mistakes. They think, well, I've got the gift of healing. I've got the gift of prophecy. I got the gift of this, that, and the other. No. This is it. If we really want to be like Jesus, we've got to take on Jesus. So when Jesus comes and lives in us by his spirit, he doesn't come as some great mighty magician or wonder worker, he comes someone who has a nature meek and lowly in heart. Do we really understand Jesus? We really got to know him and he'll make you and I just like that. God resists the proud and gives grace to, to the humble. Humble yourself. Why? Because that's how Jesus is. That's how God is. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. This is the Jesus I know. Is it the Jesus you know? There's so much more, isn't there? Just as we read the New Testament, it's a very simple message. I to read about Jesus in the Gospels. We don't see him as some person extolled, do we? 
he was despised and rejected. It says in Isaiah, he'd be despised and rejected. And so will you. Because if you have his nature in you, you become despised and rejected of men and persecuted. Jesus said, this is the Jesus I want. Amen. So there we are. Father, we thank you for this lovely Jesus, humble and, and meek and lowly. Father, we pray that you make us more and more like yourself, Lord. We don't want the things this world offers us, riches and cars and all the rest of it. We want you, Lord, above all things. Lord, it's out of your poverty you've come to make us rich, rich towards God, rich in faith, rich in grace, rich in mercy, rich in kindness toward others. Things the world rejects. They rejected you because you were full of those things. Hallelujah. Most of all, Lord, full of love. So we commit this word and we commit ourselves to you now in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.